Hello everybody, welcome back to Let's Play Saga Red Dead, where we play Red Dead Redemption 2 and tell cowboy stories. Today I'm going to start the story of Doc Holliday. Um, I'm going to finish his story, um, well part of his story I'm going to finish along with uh, my talkings of Wyatt Earp when we talk about the OK Corral and Tombstone. But I'm going to start his story here, do a piece of his story with uh, Wyatt Earps, and then do a little bit of Wyatt and Doc Holliday's together when I finish up Doc's story. Um, because their stories are so intertangled, it's really hard not to just tell those parts of those stories together. Um, but I am going to do just one whole episode just on Tombstone. Um, so when we get done with this, we'll probably go back to Wyatt and talk about what led him up to where this story stops, then do a section on Tombstone, and then finish up both of their stories in an episode as well. So that being said, uh, Doc Holliday was a dentist. Uh, he became a dentist at the age of 21. Uh, his mother had died at 15 and um, from tuberculosis and he ended up contracting the disease. Um, some six years later, it was starting to become a problem. Um, and he decided that he might need to move to a warmer climate. Now, he was a southern, southern gentleman, but he decided he needed to move to a, a little bit of a warmer climate. He ended up in Fort Griff, Texas, where dentistry just wasn't working out because the coughing and whatnot was turning away the the clients um, so he turned to gambling which back then that was a reputable profession I mean, he he dealt poker and faro and all of that at uh, at John Shancy's saloon in Fort Griffith now in 18 uh, 1869 in 1869 uh, Wyatt Earp uh, was in chase of a, of a train robber named Dave Rudderbur, and he ended up in Port Griffin, where he met up with the uh, the saloon owner there, John Shan uh, Shancy, and he was asking to see if uh, Rudderbur had come through. I think it might actually be pronounced Rudderbaugh. Um, in either case, he was trying to find out if that man had come through or not, and uh, he told him to talk to the dealer, which happened to be Doc Holliday. Doc Holliday gave him some information that uh, the man might be headed back to Kansas, and it eventually led to the capture of Dave Rudderbaugh. And they started their friendship there. Now, Doc went up to Dodge City, Kansas in 1878, um, where he tried dentistry again. He took out an ad uh, in the newspaper there, and it read, John H. Holliday, dentist, very respectfully offers his professional services to the citizens of Dodge City and surrounding counties during the summer. Office at room number 24, Dodge House, where satisfaction is not given, money will be refunded. Um, but the tuberculosis has really just dug into him, and uh, he just he just couldn't keep the business open, so he turned back to gambling. So we're going to take a little break here. When we come back, I'm going to talk just a tad about Doc's first gunfight and some of my feelings about Doc Holliday, and then we'll get a little further into this story. But there's some dialogue here. I feel like you guys may want to see it. I took your advice, sir. I took your advice. Then your God has finally deserted you. What you talking about? I took your advice, sir. I have removed myself from Morpheus's embrace. No more shall I sink, sir. I am free. I am free. You don't seem free, friend. You seem drunk. Sit down, Reverend. We ain't finished. You ain't finished. Look at him, he's finished. None of us forced liquor down his throat, friend. I just want him to play. Now, firstly, we ain't friends. 
Don't make no mistake on that subject. Now, secondly, he can't hardly see, let alone reason. Now, reasoning ain't never been one of my strong points, neither, but seeing I do just fine. You want to step outside or do a business here? I just want him to finish the game. Why can't we all just get along? These are good men, Arthur. They're children of God. They are children of God. <laughs> oh. Well, how's about you playing his place, huh? That seems fair. Fair? Sure. You want a game? Sure. I'll play a few hands. Well, sit yourself down, then. I'm Luther. This is Marvin. All right, Fortunate back for into you both it. Gentlemen, about this. Same goes for you. So, there's a lot of uh, mudslinging so, going around about history right now, know. and uh, a lot of things about friends. history. Are, oh, they're getting changed, and all of this. Um, some years that back, it was. Uh, I guess it's you know, there, there's a lot of debate over how many gunfights Doc Holliday was even in. No and the reality is is that the history of that was written down by the people who were there. Well, now they're wanting to say, oh, well, we can't verify that, so it wasn't real. It's like, nobody who was there, like, if you weren't there, you can't verify it. So if that's the fact, then there ain't no history that's real. Um, what I do know is that for the longest time, Doc Holliday's first gunfight was attributed to a specific incident. Now, he did shoot guns at people before this, but this was his first gunfight. And now, history is trying to be, oh, that wasn't his first gunfight. In fact, it's even hard to find now because they're like, we can't even verify that that happened. For the love of God, people. The, I don't know. I had this same problem when I was doing the Bahala show, um, where the historians are all of a sudden like, "Oh, well, history is not actually history. We don't we don't listen to the people who were there, who wrote it down, who saw it, uh, because we can't verify it." Well, no crap, you can't verify it. You weren't there. All history is at best second-hand information, if not third, fourth, or fifth-hand information. So, that being said. Doc Holliday's first gunfight, and this, uh, to me, at least speaks to the character of Doc Holliday. He was a southern gentleman. He grew up in the south. He had manners. He was very well educated. He spoke Latin, um, and he was in a bar playing cards, and there was a, client, a, a customer there who started roughing up the ladies a little bit. Now, this man was thrown out. He got mad, and he started shooting up the bar. Doc Holliday stepped out of the door of the bar under gunfire, drew his revolver, and shot this man in the hip, effectively stopping the gunfight. Now, this gunfight is not credited to Doc Holliday as a win, even though obviously he won. Doc Holliday only has two confirmed kills, and that's all they count for one gunfights from him. So apparently you had to kill a man to win a fight. And I have a problem with that because I consider this a fight one, and it speaks to the character of the man. Rather than kill this man who was drunk and upset, he shot him in the hip and left him alive, left him to live out the rest of his life. And if you look at a lot of Doc's fights, you'll find that they're very much similar. Doc Holliday was a dangerous, deadly man who was lightning fast and very scary to be around. But he wasn't out for killing, not unless it was necessary, not unless it had to happen. That, to me, tells more about Doc Holliday than any of these modern day historians will while they're trying to mudsling and destroy the reputation of a great gunfighter. They claim two fights, but there were countless fights that this man was in, and you don't get deadly fast and... and steely-eyed reflexes like Doc Holliday did, where he was a steady hand even when drunk. Unless you've been in it. Unless you had the bullets flying at you. Now, part of Doc Holliday's ability to walk into a hail of gunfire had to do with his lack of fear. 
Uh, he wasn't afraid. He already knew he was dying. If the bullets didn't get him, the tuberculosis would. And that's also important to remember about how he was able to do some of the things he did. Because when you're not afraid and you can steady your hand and you can choose where the bullet goes, that's really important. That being said, we're going to get back to Dodge City. So, in Dodge City, he ended up having to close his dentistry for the same reasons he had closed it before. The coffin was turning away clients and the tuberculosis was just running rampant through his system. Now, he ended up turning back to gambling and one night at the Long Branch Saloon, Doc was dealing faro and Wyatt Earp came in. Now, while Wyatt Earp was in there, of course he was a marshal at the time, okay? You're going down. This is real funny here in the game, I did not mean to do that. Oh my God. Him. <laughs> I was trying to punch the man. Damn it, Reverend. Now, while he was in the bar, Wyatt Earp was in there, okay? Some men who had, uh, who had a problem with her come busting up into the bar. One of the main men came in, gun drawn, said, said to Earp, pray and jerk your gun. Time has come, Earp. Before anyone seen it, and this will tell you how fast Doc was, before anyone had seen it, Doc had pulled his gun from his holster and placed it to the man's head. And he said, well, I don't, you know what? To be fair, I don't think this man had his gun drawn. I won't tell us so. But there were a bunch of these men. He pulled his gun, stuck it to the man's head, and said, No, friend, you draw or throw up your hands. Reverend, get off the damn tracks! Very, very fast man, Doc was. Now, all of that being said, this did nothing but to solidify the friendship between Doc and Wyatt Earp. Uh, Wyatt Earp is quoted in saying, I am a friend of Doc Holliday because when I was city marshal in Dodge City, Kansas, he came to my rescue and saved my life when I was surrounded by desperados. The two of them would go on to do many, many things together later in life and it turns that Doc Holliday never really had a lot of friends. If you ever watched the movie Tombstone, you, you've, heard, you've heard that phrase before about Doc Holliday not really having any friends. He would follow Wyatt Earp across the, the, the west to do many other things and really think all he ever wanted was just to be near his friend, someone who actually counted him as one in return. Dying from tuberculosis as he was, not a lot of people wanted to be around the man. Um, so, uh, at the end of 1879, Wyatt Earp would follow his brothers to the mining town of Tombstone, Arizona. Okay. It wasn't very long after that Doc followed. Have I been bad again, Mr. Morgan? I'm sorry. I wish I was different. <laughs> We're gonna let this play out. Let's get you home. Home? Yeah, that's a wonderful idea. I could have tea with Margaret. Margaret? Who's Margaret? But. <sighs> All right. In either case, Trouble always seemed to follow Doc wherever he went, and Tombstone, Arizona was no exception. You shut up. So in the next couple episodes, we'll talk about Wyatt Earp, and we'll bring his story up current with where we are right here, sitting at Tombstone, Arizona. Then we'll do an episode about Tombstone, and then we'll do a, fi a final episode about Earp and holiday and finish out the both of their stories together um, 
and I hope you have uh, you've all enjoyed stories. It's like I said, man. Like history is one of those things that people want to just dog on all the time, and here lately they've really been trying to just tear it a new one. Um, the reality is, is that things happened in history, and times were different, and customs were different. And as much as I hate that some of these things were okay back then, that was normal in how things were back then. That doesn't make it right, but it also doesn't mean that it's the only part of history that matters anymore either. The thing about history is that you need to look at it and you need to learn all the lessons that it has to give. Now, Doc was most likely a racist man based on some of the things that he did in his history. But, given where he was from, given the time, and given the state of the, the Union itself, that was not an uncommon thing. Uh, it doesn't make it right that it wasn't uncommon, but it also wasn't frowned upon at the time. There was no reason for this man to feel like he was doing something bad or wrong because of it. That being said, Doc was well educated and he was a very friendly man and he was a caring person who chose to not kill men in gunfights that he could have easily killed which tells me if he had a reason to feel bad about it he probably would have it was the state of everything around him that caused him to be what he was just like the state of everything around us today causes us to be what we are and judge the man based on today's society it's kind of something you really can't do because as much as we don't believe in racism, or you know, as much as we think racism is a bad thing today, you put one of us back in their society, and you judge us based on the morals and values of the country then, and you're the odd one out. And that's the problem with judging people from different times by different times. You gotta judge the man, you gotta look at the entire picture, and the entire picture of this man was a good, well-educated, well, kind man. I'll keep an eye on him. I do believe that he if he lucky. thought he was being a certain kind of way that was wrong, I think he may have strived to fix it. I could be wrong. But you got to learn from all the parts of history, not just the parts of history that offend you. You can learn some things about loyalty from Doc Holliday. You can learn some things about what it meant to care about human life. 